All right. Well, thank you for joining us. Uh, it's the first episode of the Lobby Bar podcast. Today, we're joined by three guests that are professionals in the risk management uh, field for uh, various sectors of essential services. Um, our goal today is to talk about you know, some of the ways essential services had to adapt and adjust the way they did things through the pandemic and um, hopefully glean some insight for some of the businesses that will be opening or are beginning to roll out openings, you know, in the coming months. Um, so, you know, today I'd just like to talk to um, you guys about some of the things that you've been doing. If you can kind of do a brief inter introduction about the, the particular sector that you're working in and, you know, what your role was um, in, in your companies. So maybe we'll start with Steve. Yeah, thanks, Roy. Um, so I am Steve Figliolo, and I work for Chick-fil-A. We are a quick service restaurant concept. Uh, and to say that the last year has been trying is certainly an understatement. Um, definitely looking forward to hear what other people have to say as well. But um, I could say that we learned a lot uh, this, this past 13, 14 months at this point. Um, which we're going to be talking about today. Awesome. Thanks, Steve. And then we'll uh, meet Randy next. Hi, Randy Rodello, uh regional manager for workers' compensation, KPC Healthcare. We have five hospitals. So back to what Steve was talking about. For us, it hit us really hard, you know, as, as to what we learned because we were one of the two trauma centers in Orange County. The other one is UCI. We're level two trauma center. So we were getting all the all the cases that were being hospitalized and so on and so forth. We ran out of ventilators. We had issues with that. Uh, so that was rough for us because there was nothing in place for me as, as the risk manager and, and the claims manager. There was, there was no script for me to how are we going to manage this. We literally had two refrigerator trucks as the morgue. We had ambulances being sent away because we couldn't take no more. So it would like Steve was talking about, it was a trying time. Now it's calmed down. It seemed like in January, February, we've only gotten 21 claims as compared to last year when we had 303. So, so it's been a trying time. Like Steve was talking about, it's been, been a trying time on us over here, especially since we're the hospital and the frontline provider. Awesome. Thanks, Randy. And then next we'll uh, meet Alvina. Hi, I'm Alvina Garcia. I work for the 99 cent stores. I am the senior workers comp and safety manager. I've been there for four years. And so the 99 cent store is an extreme value retailer. We provide uh, groceries, fresh and general mer merchandise to our customers. And, you know, just like the, the other two gentlemen uh, noted, this past year was definitely a challenge and um, one that, you know, kept changing. So we as an organization had to change and adjust what our policies and procedures were. And for us, the biggest challenge was just keeping track of the different mandates and ordinances since we operate in, uh, you know, four different states. And so the city, county, and state either mandates or ordinances were um, evolving and changing. And so just keeping track of those changes and implementing them uh, to our locations and making sure that the communication was concise and that it was clear so that the stores could then take it and, and implement it. So I'll, I'll kind of direct this question to, to everybody in the room. Um, you know, what, what kinds of challenges would you guys say um, – you were facing specifically, you know, trying to manage your everyday risk with, you know, dealing with COVID and what risks that COVID-19 brought, because, you know, I feel like we spent a lot of time in the past year, even with our clients dealing with how we're going to deal with COVID-19, but it's not like you guys had the option to just shut down. And so, um, you know, you had to continue to carry on business and have the same risks that you would normally have when you were conducting business, you know, day to day. So, um, 
you know, can any of you, you know, kind of speak to specifics about some of these challenges that you faced? Yeah, I'd love to jump in on this one, Roy. You know, at first, um, we didn't really know what was going on, right? Let, let's rewind the clocks back a, a little over a year. I don't think any of us were initially aware how long this pandemic was going to last. Uh, personally, I thought a couple weeks, maybe maybe a month or two, and then maybe over it. Maybe it was just going to be like a bad flu season. And I fully admit that I was completely wrong on that one. So our first challenge was, you know, what, what do we do with our, our restaurants? Uh, to your point, we didn't want to just close down our stores completely. We still had communities that rely on us to feed them, rely on us to provide employment, rely on our operators to be there six days a week for our customers. So we sort of had a sense that we didn't really want to disappoint the expectations of our, our rabid fans or you know, our team members and, and, and anyone who's relying on us. So the first challenge was what do we do as far as PPE and safety and what do we have in stock and, and what can we push out to the stores and help our operators obtain to keep their team members and their staff safe? So we actually relied heavily on some of our existing relationships with our suppliers and mapped out well, what is this going to look like how can we get masks and and gloves and hand sanitizer even even more than we normally would have out to the stores so that was our first hurdle and, and it was really very helpful to have some of those relationships and you know i'm not ashamed to admit that we leaned into it and and we purchased large amounts early on just not knowing thinking if we're going to err on the side of anything, let's err on the side of caution. We'd rather have too many masks, whether they're N95, you know, or, or you know, just any sort of mask that we can get to protect the team members that were compliant with, um, you know, the local regulations. And if we had extra, we had extra. So I'm glad we did because obviously we needed it more than just two months. Uh, and then it also became an issue with our suppliers of our, our food. What happens if we can't get the food out to a specific area, if they're out of drivers? And again, we're leaning into our partners and, and we were able to get people to the table together because of this global issue as it was turning into and having ultimately competitors strategically work together to provide the products to our stores so we can keep things running. Uh, and we decided very early on that we were going to shut down our dining rooms, which sort of changed our business model. I mean, we, we heavily relied on customers coming in, having that experience, being greeted with a team member, hearing the my pleasure. Well, all of a sudden, everything's being pushed towards the drive through. And uh, admittedly, I think we, we typically do the drive through pretty well, but it, it's a challenge when all of a sudden maybe you're, 40% of your sales were drive through and now 100% of your sales have to be drive through and figuring out those logistics that uh, we had people a lot smarter than me figuring that out. I can assure you that. Hey, Steve, was there ever a period of time early on where uh, you had to close any of your stores in a region or nationally to handle it? Either you didn't have the PPE or you had other kind of issues going on? Yeah, we didn't have anything nationally, thankfully. We didn't have any any scenario where we said every single store is closed, with the exception of a Sunday. But yeah, we, we certainly we had pockets, we had regions throughout the country, um, you know, for one re reason or another, whether it was some person tested positive and maybe it was an outbreak, we're going to close down, we're going to do a deep cleaning for three days. Um, it, it could... Honestly, we had some locations where they were just short staffed because people were out for, it may not have even been COVID related, maybe just other reasons, personal reasons, and operators just couldn't always staff everything. How about you, Alvina? Um, what were some of the challenges you guys faced? So for us, it was uh, pretty much a lot of the, the same that, you know, a lot of businesses saw. Um, initially, it was trying to understand exactly the extent of, you know, this 
now new virus that was affecting the entire nation and how it was going to affect us in the long run. And so preparing for that and, you know, like Steve mentioned, admittedly us too, in the beginning, we didn't think it was going to be as serious as it turned out to be. So we proceeded very cautiously initially, thinking that it was something that within a few weeks would probably be gone and forgotten about. And so um, we proceeded with caution and little did we know, you know, we were going to end up in this situation over a year later. Um, But sourcing, you know, a lot of the PPE for us as well, even though on a regular basis, uh, we sell those type of items in our stores. Customers were, you know, flocking to our stores to, to buy the exact same thing. And so the partnerships that we had with our vendors um, luckily saved us and we were able to secure those pretty quickly. Um, but then, you know, we had associates who were afraid of continuing to work and remaining in an environment where, you know, we were having customers come in and out of the store every single day. And at one point we had, um, well, altogether, I would say we had about 4,000 employees who took a leave of absence uh, due to COVID. So that was a significant hit to our, our staff and our ability to maintain a certain amount of hours uh, for our stores to be open. You know, without staff, we wouldn't be able to maintain our stores open, you know, our regular hours. And so in some locations, we did have to reduce the amount, the hours that our locations were open. And luckily, we never had to close down aside from, um, you know, for cleaning procedures, because we did have an outbreak. There were a couple of locations where, unfortunately, we did see COVID outbreaks. Um, And so the locations were just closed uh, for extensive cleaning, but we were able to reopen the following day um, at a reduced capacity and reduced hours. And so um, the challenges with staff, with PPE, with, you know, the, the changing guidance of the CDC and the state's and even the counties as to what we were required to do. Um, And for us, you know, I think one of our bigger challenges was also our customers. Um, Some customers who refused to wear masks and that posed an issue in our locations. And, you know, for those reasons, some of our employees were fearful of continuing to work. And it also caused um, claims in and of itself where there was altercations with customers who wanted to shop within our stores, but didn't want to comply with the mask ordinances. Randy? Yeah, uh, so um, like Ed, we talked about, you you guys were on uh, still front line. For myself, we were the hospital in Orange County, all the hospitals, Victorville, if you've ever been to Victorville, it's very desolated out there. We have one hospital, they were overrun. All our hospitals were overrun. So the biggest, we had a lot of we had a lot of hurdles because one we had frontline workers who there's no way we're gonna close down our hospitals but we couldn't keep staff because what was happening at that time is our people were getting exposed now this is before Governor Newsom's order came out talking about the talking about uh, the presumed claims and with the you have to be positive within 24 uh, within 14 days what I did initially is besides I had to talk to senior management because the concern we had was CDC guidelines were if you were exposed, potentially exposed, you have to go home and self-quarantine for 14 days. That was the initial guidelines. Problem was is there was nothing in place. So the way senior management on my my company was viewing it as it's like the flu, they can catch it anywhere. So let them go home for 14 days and use their PTO or cash plus or vacation time. Well, that was a big push by me because I was like, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. You, the biggest challenge we had is, look, we have unions. We have nursing unions. We have SEIU unions at the hospitals. So I didn't want to upset the unions. I also didn't want them to get litigated. So what I had to talk to senior management about, my biggest challenge was, hey, you can't tell me that you're going to send a nurse or a medical professional home for 14 days and then say, you can't work with us for 14 days per CDC guidelines. We're not going to pay you. Use your own vacation time. If you don't have vacation time, then we'll front you the vacation time and then you'll owe 80 hours. That was a big push that we had 
I had to fight with senior management on it. And I said, look, within the 14 days, if they test positive, once they test positive, I'll have my work comp team, which is over at Athens, pick them up from day one and pay them disability. Because that was the biggest issue we had was how to get the people back, you know, once get them paid so they don't get upset. I mean, you're at home. You can't leave anywhere. You can't go get another job. You know, we had to get them paid. State disability was way backed up for months. You're not going to get money through there. So we had our work comp team pay it. The problem comes in, as you guys know, with the we we're a captive, so with our own insurance, but the premiums, it's hard to talk to senior management and say, hey, we want you to pay these guys up front. And then, like, oh, well, wait a minute, that's going to cost us a lot of money. Well, no, cost us a lot of money in the long run is when they go litigated. That's going to cost us a lot of money in the long run. And you get the psych issues and get the secondary stuff that comes in. The good thing is they listened to me after a couple meetings. And the biggest challenge for me was I rolled out this whole new program. I put together a, a spreadsheet. I put together a COVID-19 questionnaire that the nurses had to answer. I had I assigned a nurse to every single COVID place we had because we needed the nurse to set them up with medical appointments at the clinics to get them back to work. You can't tell somebody who's living with you know, a couple other people, you got to quarantine your room, you got to set up your appointments. So I wanted to make sure it was easy for our staff. And that was my biggest concern is, all these stuff to make it easy for our employees, especially at the hospital. Randy, were you able to uh, satisfy all your staffing issues with just the traveling nurses or were you short staffed a lot of the time? No, we were short staffed. In fact, uh, sometimes like the two big, the two, three main hospitals that got hit were Anaheim Global, uh, Orange County, of course, were level two trauma center. And the other one that was got hit was uh, Victor Valley. The other two hospitals were Chapman and South Coast. They weren't hit that hard. So what we had to do is we had one of our compliance officers, they had to start arranging people in HR, and they were actually sending people, traveling, sending people to go to the other hospitals to staff them from the other hospitals. That's problematic sometimes because Orange County, our biggest hospital, we don't have any unions. Every other hospital has unions. We're trying to keep unions out of the hospital Orange County but if you're short staffed, you got to use union staff from the other hospital. So you see where the problem comes in. But the senior management said, you know, we don't care. Bring them in. So we, that's how we staffed them. But we had about 60% traveling nurses who were making. So um, do you guys have any changes in your protocols or procedures that you look at and think like they will be um, beneficial for you going forward? Because you know, all of the industries seem like we had to make some adaptations and some of these adaptations I think will be beneficial to us um, going forward. And um, I know that I've experienced some inefficiencies that we've been able to solve. Um, do you guys see any positives from, you know, the, the implementation of your new procedures? You know, I love that question, Roy. It just kind of reminds me of a belief that's something that I really do hold true and dear is that from chaos comes clarity. So I think throughout all this, it's very important to remember there are some positive things that can come out of all this. Yes, there's a ton of negative. It's very easy to dwell on it, but let's focus on some of the positives. You know, for us, we learn very quickly how to adapt, especially the drive through line and and what that means for our business models going forward and what does it look like if the play areas are, are closed and we know that there are families with young children who look at chick-fil-a and they say hey this is a safe place for my kids to come play i can grab a cup of coffee have a bite to eat and, and just have a few minutes to just watch them from afar and and be okay and i know that everything's gonna be all right well it, our play areas have been closed in over a year. So we've proven that we can still run a business without that play area, without people relying on that. I mean, I don't necessarily know what the future looks like going forward. If from a claim standpoint, general liability, I would I would not be sad if we never reopened the play pits and, and for the kids. But, you know, and, and part of it too, when we talk about our team members, especially when you're serving someone food, I think there's that extra layer of comfort, we'll call it, when someone's wearing a mask and a glove and they're handing you a sandwich and you know that, okay, you know, their hands have been washed and you don't have to worry about 
cleanliness. And, and I'll tell you, our foodborne illness claims were the lowest that we had ever seen for 2020 than any other year. And uh, yeah, I think a part of that too is is the guests and our customers. They're also washing their hands feverishly throughout the day. So there's less chance of an alleged foodborne illness um, that comes through. I, I hope that practice continues <laughs> for, for many, many reasons. And, you know, we're also, one thing that we really dove into was that third-party delivery and our own operator-led delivery when it came to food. I mean, our customers, a lot of them didn't want to leave their homes. They weren't comfortable even going through a drive through I totally get it. No judgment. So it forced our hand to really lean into those partners who do that third-party delivery. And a couple of operators wanted to figure out, well, what, what would this look like if I do it on my own? And, and now, all of a sudden... We have team members out driving their vehicles, delivering food from the restaurant to the customer to give that Chick-fil-A experience to someone, you know, and, and get, be greeted at the door and hear, you know, my pleasure, as opposed to just some independent third party who doesn't necessarily represent Chick-fil-A in that moment. So we're hoping that experience can extend beyond the restaurant and, you know, now that that pendulum is sort of swung, I don't necessarily see it going back. I mean, selfishly, it's very easy to order food from my phone and have someone here in 15 minutes, you know, with waffle fries and a sandwich. And yeah, if, if I can do that every day and not go into a restaurant, I mean, that's going to be a viable option for me. Hey, Steve, so, uh, you know, all of us have, uh, or at least I'm sure most of us at least have been through a Chick-fil-A drive through I mean, what specifically have you, did you guys change to like handle that like increased drive through volume? Like I've seen, I've seen the several lanes here in Sacramento at some of your locations where you've divided up lanes and then your staff members outside taking orders down the row, which seems to work really well. Anything, anything else or in other regions, different things? One thing that really stood out and I have to give all the credit to these operators who they're entrepreneurs. But our mall operators probably suffered the most because many malls across the country were closed and, and no one was really going out and shopping. So a lot of them worked with, you know, whoever was the landlord to create a drive through in the mall parking lots where there was no other business since there were no other patrons and doing sort of an ad hoc makeshift drive through. And this is how they were able to sustain sales and, and keep people employed and keep their businesses running throughout this pandemic. I don't think prior to this, I would have ever thought that having your own drive through would have been a thing in a mall location. I, I mean, we talk about how malls are dying every day, you know, before COVID. So that was some real ingenuity on behalf of our operators to figure out, okay, if people aren't going to go inside the mall, what can we do to attract them to this location? And our freestanders, they learned how to turn empty parking spaces and in, again, into ad hoc drive throughs And, you know, there's actually, there's one, um, what we consider a, a walk up, a, a drive through only, if you will, out in, in Hollywood near you guys. And, that's one of our busiest locations and pre and post COVID. I mean, they just are always busy. And so some of it were other operators leading into them saying, how do you sustain this model? What do you do? How does this translate into my location? Because each location is going to be unique and, and face their own challenges. So we did have our operators band together and sort of learn from one another uh, about their best practices. How about you guys, Alvina? Did you guys have any um, specific procedures that you think will, you know, stand the test of time even post COVID? Yeah, I think our, our increased um, or enhanced, I should say, uh, cleaning procedures. So previously, it was a challenge for us uh, to find the time in the store's operating hours to be able to conduct such, such ex extensive cleaning. And so during COVID, what we were doing is closing a little bit early to give our associates the ability to get in there and really clean and disinfect some of the high-touched areas and do more thorough cleaning than you know had we had previously been able to do. 
And so I think that workaround um, is one that will probably end up staying as we have now assigned, you know, some of those specific tasks to team members that can sort of keep up with it throughout the day um, instead of having to designate a specific time for it to be done. Um, Another thing would be, you know, our ability to work from home for our corporate employees. Our corporate office um, would see, I would say about, you know, maybe three to 400 employees at any given time. And we were really running out of space. You know, that had been a topic of conversation among the senior leadership team is, you know, what are we going to do when we hit um, that crossroad as far as we can't hire any more people, we don't have any more room for them, but the company continues to grow. And so with COVID, uh, what they realized is that we could continue uh, to be effective and efficient, even working from home. And so I think they've already made that decision uh, that the amount of employees that we had in the corporate office at one point, you know, prior to COVID was already way too much. So moving forward, they're going to allow um, uh, employees who can the ability to have a blended work schedule where some days they work in the office and some days they work from home. And if some prefer to just be completely remote, then they'll have the ability to do that as well. Yeah, I, we do the same thing. I personally love that hybrid model and being able to work from home. Yeah, we... Um... For us, we've kind of changed our outlook for real estate in general. You know, like we have an office in LA and we were uh, coming up on the end of a lease and I was con- debating whether I wanted to go significantly bigger to give us room to grow. And I kind of chose to stay pretty much the same size office space wise and allow us to grow in that hybrid model where we don't have everyone in the office at the same time. Randy, how about you? Do you have any, um, I guess, procedures or things that you guys have implemented that you think will um, last beyond the the, the pandemic? Uh, like 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 Avi was talking about, Steve was talking about. Now with the hospital, what we did before is is hospitals don't make that much money. Okay, there's a very thin line of of, of profit we make. Uh, after what happened and the way we changed everything around. Uh, we went to now before we were. I hate to say, the way uh, our purchasing was, they were purchasing only what they needed. Okay, and, and that's what got us into trouble in the first place. Was if you don't need a, a bunch, of, bunch of masks, why invest the money in them? We can invest it somewhere else under the equipment. Now, what they're doing, especially at, at for our, for KPC, is they're beefing up the stock and everything because. Again, there is a concern. There may be another, there may be a third wave coming and, you know, in the end of the year or whatever it is. So they're starting to stock more equipment or improving some of the, some of our entry and exits. Now we haven't, we're still taking temperatures. And I think that's going to be a, that's going to be a thing we're going to be doing going forward uh, because we have to protect the hospital. And even though they're saying COVID is, you know, but I think California's opening on June 15th or something, Governor Newsom said. Uh, we're still, according to our safety committee, they're still going to follow the procedures we have in place right now, which is somebody comes in, we give them a, we test them with the thermometer, and then we put a label on them. That's going to stay. So some of the processes of getting into the hospital and not having 25 people walk in when a family member and all that, that is now what they're improving on the process. Because before it was... Hey, you come on in, you can have three or four people in the room, but usually more people walked in and you'd have eight people in the room. Now they're they're following those guidelines strictly. Like how many people are in the room? Only two allowed. And the nurses are coming in, checking on them. If there's more people, they kick the people out or people have to take turns. So that's good because that just stops the transmission if we have. At the same time, our, our EVS staff have been trained more in depth and bought new products to make sure that we sanitize and clean everything we can, you know, better than what we did before. Now, we didn't have any major issues of staph infections and that kind of stuff, but now we got more supplies, we got better equipment, okay? And the procedures I have in place already for when COVID hit, 
they're staying now they're now in the employee manual and they're now in our iipp yeah you know randy helvina i'll be you know from a customer perspective like not that i have a reason to go to the hospital knock on wood but i love the fact that you'd still be checking temperatures even if it's not a requirement that would at least make me feel comfortable more at ease and helvina you know shopping in the store personally i would have no issues if i see you know one of your team members cleaning something it's like okay i'm not going to bother them with the question they're obviously doing something very important you know let me go find somebody else if i have a question about a product so i mean i don't know how that would necessarily translate but i would just imagine that the the public perception even if it's not a requirement is something that's going to stay just to keep that goodwill within the community Randy, did you have any um, like operational efficiency gains that you found w w making all these changes, like increased telehealth or anything like that that the the hospital in implemented, which are like that you that you'll keep after all this? Yeah, uh, the telehealth. Uh, you know, m most of our doctors we're we're for profit hospitals, so we're for profit hospital. All the doctors are independent. We we can't we can't employ any doctors. So that's one of the caveats with the hospital system. So uh, the telemedicine was a brand new thing for us. And that's something they invested in heavily here because you had people that were like coming in saying, hey, by the way, you know, my back hurts. I need to go to the ER room. We were pushing them away saying, well, we got COVID here. You, you can't come. So then we had people you know, that couldn't go anywhere. They, everything was filled up. It was at night. There's no industrial plants open, nothing, because everything was shut down. So uh the telemedicine started to come in they invested heavily in that we got some up for the doctors and in, in, in the doctor's lounge and that's been a big hit because then for some doctors were handling non-covid related cases so somebody would come in they go to the hospital emergency room they'd be like hey go in this room over here we'll connect you to a doctor keep them isolated from the covid19 and then they're able to talk to the doctor so they're going to follow that procedure now at night especially because you know you're getting all these random shootings come in and that kind of stuff so now they're going to start being more safe. And if it's not a life-threatening emergency, they're probably going to just follow the teledoc thing. But that's one good thing that came out of this was the doctors we have now are like, hey, can I see them via teledoc? Fine, go ahead. You know, just as long as they can do it. And that's how we had to handle it with people coming in. Because regardless of whether they're COVID, you still had people that were breaking legs, hurting their arms, not COVID, you know, and they needed treatment. So, you know, the senior management was quick to respond to that with the teledoc and put it separate we didn't have any hospitals we can open anywhere else so i mean it came in handy and it did it gave the community here a chance to get their non-covid related claims handled medications were written and sent and everything and it was nice it was one good thing that came out of it and that's something we're going to keep still for people who can't come to the hospital or don't want to come to the hospital for whatever reason now they're going to do the teledoc so that was a big thing that happened and it was fantastic for us. I was just going to say that I think, you know, this past year really forced a lot of organizations and then, you know, just individuals themselves to be more comfortable and get up to speed with technology. Um, you know, holding meetings via Zoom. You know, we laughed about the, the attorney with the cat filter. Um, I'm sure, you know, he's figured that out now and how to properly use, use Zoom now. Um, but with us as well, you know, um, to Randy's point, we were able to also implement telemedicine through our uh, triage uh, hotline. And so for us, our, our procedures, when an employee sustains an injury, they have to call our nurse hotline. And so through that triage, the nurse would then direct the employee to either go to an occupational clinic, um, to the hospital, or, you know, in the lesser severity cases, just self-treat. And what we've been able to do is actually implement a telemedicine option for the employee through that call. And so now when they call, if um, it checks all the boxes to qualify for telemedicine, the nurse will then transfer the line over uh, to a doctor. And so the employee won't even have to leave the store. They don't have to go anywhere. And for us, that's, that's a big win because a lot of our associates um, have transportation issues. Or some of our locations are in rural areas where getting to and from a doctor's clinic um, is an issue in of itself. So 
now they have that option. And we did see, you know, hesitation on the part of our associates at the beginning, even with the occupational clinics who themselves didn't want patients coming in and were offering the telemedicine. Uh, we did see a decline in, you know, the visits that our, our associates are keeping. Uh, but it seems that they've gotten more comfortable with the idea. And so, you know, now I, I think a lot of people actually prefer to have that telemedicine appointment, especially when it's just uh, a follow-up. Yeah, I think telemedicine is here to stay in some form or fashion. I mean, really, I think any, any of these video chats and communications are. And when you think about the private sector, uh, you know, telehealth isn't really anything new. Uh, it's been around. I've used it before if I had, you know, say a sinus infection and I can video chat with the doctor and they write the prescription and I can go and pick it up. So the fact that, you know, work comp is finally catching up to, to private health care, I think it's a good thing. And I think, Alvina, to your point, especially when it comes to um, time away from work and, and that backfill, right? You know, for us in a restaurant, okay, if we lose a cook and they got to go you know, wait and, and, and see a doctor physically, well, okay, now who needs to backfill that position? Because it's the lunch rush and we have a hundred orders coming in this next hour that we need to fill and, and they need to be cooked. Can we call someone early? Well, how early can they get here? So it's a lot of that trickle down that you don't even necessarily think about as a claims handler, because you're just thinking about that one individual claim, but as a business owner and someone running an organization, it's more than just one person who's impacted by an injury and an initial visit to a doctor. Have you guys experienced any pushback from your staff and employees for some of the new policies and procedures you guys are trying to put in place? I can chime in on that and, and I, I, I'll say no. Um, in all honesty, it, it was quite the opposite for us. We had, associates who were calling out um, other associates or even their managers themselves for not following what would, you know, were our policies and procedures. Um, and in some cases, they were even acting as, you know, the mask police in our location, some to, you know, our, our, their own detriment sort of thing. But um, I think, you know, they, they understood the uh, the severity of what we were facing, and they understood the risks. And so we didn't necessarily have associates pushing back on, let's say, you know, our policy to wear a mask, you know, whenever they're at work, or the frequent hand washing or, or any of that. Um, you know, like I said, it was it was quite the opposite for us, and in in some cases, even you know that caused a, a bit of an issue when they uh, would get into altercations with customers who refused to wear masks uh, because they, in in a sense, they were trying to protect themselves. Um, but we didn't see, I would, I to say, pushback from our associates as far as having to implement these policies regarding. Um, COVID, very, very few and rare cases that I, it wouldn't make, you know, anything stand out for us. Yeah, I think for us, our biggest pushback is going to be bringing people back into the corporate office now that we've all been working from home for over a year and a lot of us have been very successful at it. So how does that look? Because before this, we didn't have a work from home policy. It was pretty much understood that you'd be going into the corporate office and, you know, we had 3000 people there and what do we do now? And how do you get people comfortable? And, you know, Alvina, you know, to your point, you know, we may have people who just aren't comfortable returning back and being around other people, regardless of if you're six feet away. And that's something we're still navigating to this day. And, and I don't have an answer, but if anyone does, I'd love to hear what you guys have been doing. Well, you know, for, for us, I mean, the pushback we're getting from, and, we, and we're getting it from the unions uh, at the hospital, we're getting it from some of the nurses too, and some of the charge nurses, the older nurses, the ones that are in management, their view is, you know, we've, and, and we're going to come across it. I, I know that I have one litigated claim, but we've had a couple of nurses who are like, Hey, I don't feel comfortable coming back in the hospital right now. 
So that's always been an issue that we just started to come across in since probably September. We've had people saying, I'm not coming back to the hospital. I'm not going to do it. They left the work. Now the question, now the, now the thing we're running into is, and for the attorneys, is because I think it's going to be big for everybody else. How do you tell somebody, hey, your schedule is, you know, they're 12 hour nurses, 12 hour shifts. You come in three days a week. You say, you know what? I don't want to come in three days a week. So is that refusal to work or is that refusal to work because they're worried about COVID? They can still get it. They work in a hospital, which we're the front line on that. So that's something that I'm talking to general counsel about and all that. The pushback we're getting from the unions is how can you ensure the hospital is safe for our union members? We're following all the procedures per CDC guidelines. We're doing everything we can, but is that good enough? Don't know. I think in the healthcare industry, I think in the next year or so, that is going to be tested a lot because I know somebody's going to say, I don't want to come into work. I'm afraid. I got COVID. I was sick. I was hospitalized. Now I feel better. I want my job. Can you give me another job? And you're like, well, no, you're a nurse, LVM, whatever it is. You got to come into work. There's going to be some hospitals who are going to say, you know what? You don't come into work. We're going to term you. Then you can see where it's going to be a potential civil case for a wrongful termination. But is it wrongful termination? We need you to work. You don't want to work because of COVID. I mean, you, you guys from attorneys, you know, Jason and Roy, you guys see what I'm talking about. The issue is convoluted. And I know I, and that's something, the pushback that we're trying to walk a fine line with the unions on. Hey, whatever you need, we're here for you. We'll give you it. We'll make sure your nurses are safe. We got better equipment. We got better cleaning procedures. Everything, OSHA's come in. They've cleared it. It's still, we're going to have a couple of those employees who are going to test it and say, you know what? Uh, I, you know, I, I don't want to come back to work because I, I don't feel safe. And then why don't you feel safe? Well, it's not safe there. Why? We don't have the proper PPE. Then you go into the PPE. I mean, you guys can see the spiral that, that we're about to go into. That's the biggest pushback we're getting right now is them is coming back to work. Is that widespread or is that just a few a few of your litigating? Uh, From the other people I've cases? talked to, I've talked to Athens, our TPA. They have six different hospitals, Huntington, they have PIH, they have a couple others. They're, they're seeing the same thing. There's some people who are saying, and it's mostly – and again, I'm, I'm in my 50s, so I'm not saying anything about older people. I don't want any age issues here. But it's mostly the older generation who are like, look, I don't want to put myself in jeopardy by coming back. Until this thing is eradicated, everybody's, you know, we have herd immunity, as they call it. Uh, I don't want to come back to work. And we've had a couple of nurses just quit. They get cleared from COVID. There are two negative tests or one negative test. The doctor, our PTP at Sunrise says, you're cleared to come back to work. You have no shortness of breath. You have no nothing, that kind of stuff. And they're like, you know what? I quit. I don't want to be in the industry anymore. And they just quit. So, I mean, but that hurts us because then we lose a nurse. And now you got to replace a nurse. And every hospital in this in Orange County is looking for nurses. Okay? I mean, everybody's looking for medical staff. To be a nurse right now or back in COVID days, we were joking about it. Man, they're making bank. Some nurses are working six days a week, three days here and three at another job, making 100, 110 on, as a traveler an hour. 12-hour shifts, man, but the job they were doing, hats off to them, man, because I don't know if I could do it. So, Steve, and I mean, you guys aren't having pushback from your employees coming back to work. I mean, given the fact you're in a general setting, there's no pushback from the employee saying, I don't feel safe here. I don't want to, somebody comes in without a mask, somebody panics on it, you know what I mean? I'm stressed out over it, which will be the new big issue coming up, I guarantee you guys. You guys don't have any of that yet? We do, but it's been an ongoing issue for us, um, probably since the beginning, where, you know, like you mentioned, um, the some of our older associates were the ones who were the first to raise their hand and voice concerns over them continuing to work, you know, in, in our locations. And so for the majority of them, you know, we were able to accommodate um, a leave of absence and they have, some of them have remained off. Some of them have since returned, but it, it's been an ongoing challenge. Um, I think at one point we had about 4,000 employees out, um, give or take. And like I mentioned, you know, some leaves have continued to be extended simply because of the concern. Um, but, you know, then these, we have these employees who are not working and uh, don't have any income either. And so for some, it's come to the point where they've had to make 
a decision as to whether they did want to return back to work and continue to be gainfully employed or if they just wanted to resign at that point. And, and we've had, it, you know, both situations occur. Yeah, I mean, we've definitely had some local team members who just aren't comfortable and, and you know, we still employ a lot of, you know, what I call the first jobs, right? Those 16 to 20 year olds who, who are younger and just view things a little bit differently. And it doesn't necessarily seem to be as big of an issue with that younger generation. But, you know, you almost take it on a case by case basis. And you know, what, what's everyone's comfort level, and I'm certainly not the expert at telling someone Oh, you should be 100% comfortable working here, especially if they're considered high risk and, you know, maybe they're not vaccinated. To me, that's a personal choice and that's something to to be worked out with their manager and figure out what makes sense for them. Well, well you see, speaking of that, guys, and and, uh, and Jason or Ray, you guys can chime in on this. We're having, besides the pushback, we also have some people who are the anti-vaxxers, as they call them, okay? They don't want to get the vaccination. Yet now senior management's looking at, can we require, I know there's, there's going to be a big one for everybody coming in the industry. Can we require our employees to get vaccinated before they work in the hospital? Some people say yes for safety. Some people say no, because they have the rights to say no to vaccination. And if you don't, if you say, I, I, no, nobody knows where to go on this. Maybe you guys can help us out. But, and you guys, Jason, I believe you guys have see what I'm talking about. You got somebody saying, I want to come to work for you. You're like, yes, you're qualified to work for me, but I don't want a vaccine. Well, you can't work for us. Well, then that's discrimination. Why? Because I'm an anti-vaxxer. You see what I'm talking about, Jason and Roy? Yeah, there's been a lot of talk about that. I mean, obviously, in the last few months, and there's been no guidance specifically on the national or state level that I'm aware of. I mean, I know that, like you said, there's a, can an, empl- can an empl- uh, person that's applying for a job or that works for you decline to get a vaccine either for medical or uh, religious reasons or or other reason yeah uh, probably I mean there there's uh, ADA EEOC issues with that um, <laughs> but can you have a policy that requires it otherwise or that encourages it um, probably but then you have to have all of the exceptions like you said you know I mean that's going to be an evolving thing you know especially in healthcare like you said Randy I mean do you, you it seemingly you'd want all of your employees to be vaccinated um but you're going to have a a segment or a large segment of people that won't get it you know and then how do you handle those people uh, or employees yeah i mean it's going to be an interesting thing that's going to be hashed out in the coming months if the uh, i think like steve mentioned the herd immunity thing doesn't pan out quickly in the next few months where it where this trickles yeah. down and more rapidly if this keeps going on into the uh the fall and winter and half the population isn't vaccinated and we're not at the herd immunity stage i mean it, businesses will have to make those decisions i would think it'll be interesting well, to see what it's happens but it's not clear company <laughs> yeah so so Stephen be- Avelina, for you guys if you are you uh, do you know if, if you guys talked about this for your senior management? Are they going to hire people without vaccinations? Because if I'm a, if I have vaccination, I got some a worker coworker by me, right, who's not vaccinated, and COVID can still break out because it's going to be a, it's, it's going to be like you get a COVID shot and a flu shot every year now apparently from what they're talking about. I mean, you know, and I'm like I don't want to work with this person. Now you got other personnel issues. I mean, have you guys thought about that yet? Because that's something we're looking at. Some people are like you're not you're not vaccinated. I don't want to work with them. In there, in if we're in if we're in labor and delivery, you got babies there, you know. So, I mean, there's this is just the tip of it. There's so many damn issues to go through. Yeah, so you guys. I mean, uh, another another yeah another issue, Randy, like you said, is uh, you know as part of a pre-employment medical check, physical check. Can you even ask that? That's that's uh, that's not even clear. Oh yeah, you're right, huh? Without without asking a a, a a potential hire about their personal medical history, which essentially that is. So yeah, there's well, a hopefully. lot there's a lot of layers to that. Obviously, is <laughs> it's I I I don't have the answers. I, it's gonna be it's it'll be. I'm hoping the herd immunity pans out. 
Well, I'm uh, I'm 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 hoping it too. Uh, but for Stephen Alia, have you guys got litigated claims from your COVID yet with stress? Because that seems to be the new issue coming up. Somebody's saying I got sick. I don't know how many claims you've gotten, but I got sick and you know now I'm stressed out because I got sick or I, I went home and I live with my entire family, eight people in the house, and I, I can't quarantine properly. I got them sick. Have you guys had that at all? Definitely the stress. Um, one of the things that we have started to see is um, employees who had COVID and are now represented are also adding on orthopedic um, and psych components to their claim. Um, for the most part, you know, we didn't have any employees that uh, were severely impacted by COVID as far as, you know, having to be hospitalized or or having, you know, in that seriously adverse reaction to contracting COVID. For the most part, all of them, you know, were able to get through the 14 day period and be able to come back to work. And so seeing that there's no way to really have some sort of permanent disability associated with those claims, but then still filing, you know, an application, the attorneys are now adding, you know, other body parts that could potentially have um, a permanent disability in order to, to see some sort of compensation for it. Yeah, we haven't, you know, thankfully across the board, I'm going to hope that I don't jinx, my, jinx myself and knock on everything wood here. <laughs> we haven't seen a, a major spike in litigated COVID cases, but yeah, we are starting to see that additional body parts, you know, whether it be stress or something else that they're, they're adding on to their claims. And, and some of that is just the unknown of the long-term effects of COVID as well. The long haulers. You know, and, and Randy, to your point, like, I think a lot of employers are, are hoping that someone else figures it out first and, and then we can all follow the lead, but. <laughs> Nobody wants to make bad case law guys. Trust me. I don't want to be the first one to do it. Exactly. You know, we don't want to be that first one and we're hoping that we can learn from someone else, but I think we're all in that same boat. So one final thought, I just kind of, you know, wanted to talk about some of the um, hurdles that, you know, we've faced in the litigation space, you know, since COVID started, I think, you know, we've all seen medical appointments get delayed. We've all saw how depositions weren't going forward for a good stretch of time. Um, did you guys have any other um, areas that you felt that COVID-19 affected the way that you perform discovery um, and, you know, ways that you've you know had to overcome that? Yeah, we had, um, you know, for a while, if we needed something notarized, for example, we couldn't find anyone in certain areas willing to do it. You know, a lot of banks were closed. So we were just accepting potentially, uh, you know, uh, agreements or waivers, especially if somebody was pro se that, oh, yeah, we agree, we'll settle our claim for X amount of dollars. Here's my written statement. It's not notarized, but send it in um, because we couldn't there was just no other options or, you know, someone couldn't necessarily show up, uh, you know, for a deposition. And some of it though, we kind of, I don't want to say used to our advantage, but it, it sort of helped us look at some of those older claims that maybe hadn't been moved in a while. And all of a sudden there was maybe some settlement interest. And I think un unfortunately with people not necessarily having that, um, you know, long-term financial security, not really knowing if, when they were going to go back to work again, they were thinking, okay, well, I'm going to get some money for settling my workers' comp claim and see what the future holds. Well, I know for us, we, we've been able to settle some cases that had COVID claim as a component of, of the claim itself but not uh, strictly a COVID um, application. So, you know, those that had orthopedic components or psych components and COVID was just one of the many, um, but strictly COVID claims, I don't think we, we've seen any CNRs for that.
But, you know, to Steve's point, this past year, you know, we were able to, to settle more cases um, that had been stagnant for, you know, a while, simply because of that, because these were, you know, people who were off of work already for a while and not knowing what was going to happen within this next year and whether they would be able to return to work, even if it was a different employer. Um, we saw an uptick in, you know, CNRs. And the interesting part was that, you know, in, in the very like first month or so, we saw a sort of like halt to settlements and to depositions and being able to move some of these cases along. And then all of a sudden, the applicant attorneys were the ones reaching out um, in, you know, starting the conversation about settlement uh, because they were losing a source of revenue when depositions, you know, were canceled. And so we s slowly started seeing an uptick in settlements of either cases that had just been filed and we hadn't even been able to get to the deposition yet. And so it was, it was interesting to see because that was something that, you know, normally that conversation begins on our side and wanting to get rid of those cases that we believe either, you know, don't have merit or don't have a lot of meat behind them. And so um, for us, it was seeing, and you know, that, that reach out from the applicant attorney um, wanting to settle out these cases so that um, they could then, you know, take their fee and move on to the next, next case since, you know, depositions were, were no longer, like I said, a source of revenue for them. Yeah, and what we saw on the the legal side, especially in Northern California, and I'm sure uh, Roy will, I would think he'd say the same thing in Southern California. For those first couple months in March and April last year, like Alvina said, <clears throat> you couldn't settle a case because most of the applicant attorneys, they thought this was going to be a short-term thing. And a lot of applicant attorneys straight up closed their offices. You couldn't even call them. Um, hearings were canceled. Depots were canceled. You couldn't get anything done. By May when everybody realized this might drag out for a while and the applicant council uh, knew, well, like Alvina said, I'm not getting deposition fees coming in. I'm not settling cases and I'm, uh, I'm, I'm hurting for money. All this, all of a sudden they're available by phone. They're available by email. Uh, they're working any of their old dog cases, like Steve was saying and uh, calling their clients for you. And because we weren't traveling on the defense side, which we're usually heavily traveling, uh, we were reaching out to uh, applicant councils on almost every case, seeing where they're at. And uh, we settled a ton of cases last summer because, uh, you know, the, the hearings were still kind of, uh, how, what are we going to get done in the hearings? Uh, depositions had started to go Zoom. And um, applicant attorneys were very accessible on almost every case. And so, yeah, it from a closure standpoint and uh, settling out uh, non-COVID uh, CNR, CNRs, it, it was, we were getting a lot done. Yeah, Roy, thanks for this opportunity yeah. and getting this group together. I mean, this was a lot of fun and some good conversation going back and forth. Yeah, that's, uh, nice yeah, to really see you, Steve, Alvina, and Randy. Coming on. Yeah, thank you. Nice. Thank, thanks for holding me yeah, here. There's sure. still a lot of thank questions you. come up, man. I'm, <laughs> Roy, I'm serious, man. There's so much stuff coming down the line. Yeah. Yeah, we're, we're, we're trying to be like Sullivan, and we're going to do like 19 episodes just on COVID. <laughs> oh, yeah, for but, sure. And what's to come? I mean, we don't know exactly yeah. what, what's going to stick around permanently and how we're going to have to adjust um, based on that. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you guys for participating. And once thank I get you. the uh, final edit, I'll send it out to everybody for review and then we'll get this thing up and running. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. Great. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys.